We don't always have access to arbitrarily large numbers of samples, so sometimes we need to use a limited number of samples to estimate the properties of the so-called parent distribution. The stuff on the left talks about the standard error. The stuff at the top right talks about a rule of thumb for comparing error bars. The stuff at the bottom right begins the next video module, where we will talk about illusory sample size and illusory statistical significance. We might perform an experiment where we draw data measurements from a Gaussian parent distribution with mean mu sub x and width or standard deviation sigma sub x. If we could continue to make measurements without ever stopping, then we would be able to use these formulas previously introduced to calculate the actual mean mu sub x and the actual standard deviation sigma sub x of the distribution plotted. We've written the variance sigma squared x here, so we would need to remember to take a square root to get the standard deviation sigma sub x. In both equations, we explicitly write out the limit as capital N goes to infinity to make clear that using these formulas depends on having access to arbitrarily large numbers of measurements. We do not have access to arbitrarily large numbers of measurements in real life. In a particular experiment, we have access to only a limited number of measurements of, say, these five circles. Or if we perform the experiment again, we might get these five stars. Or if we repeat the experiment, we might get five triangles. Or do the experiment again, you might get five squares. Let's talk about the experiment where we obtain the five stars. We only have five stars. We don't have arbitrarily large numbers of stars. We don't have enough data points to use the mu sub x formula. We need to devise a substitute, and this is the next best thing. We take the star data points x sub i star, we add them up, and then divide by the number of samples in the data set. Here, lowercase n equals 5. In this equation, there is no reference to the idea of a limit. m sub x is written with parentheses star to emphasize that it is generated particularly using the specific data set consisting of the five stars. We call m sub x the sample mean. It is our estimate using the limited set of five stars for the actual mean mu sub x of the actual distribution. The sample mean generated from the five stars can be plotted on this axis. Again, we are using a limited number of stars, so we don't have access to the arbitrarily large numbers of stars that we would require to work with the equation for sigma squared x. We write down a next best substitute equation let me highlight some similarities and differences. It would be nice to be able to construct square differences using x sub i and mu sub x, but we don't have the ability to calculate mu sub x if we have access only to five stars. The best we can do is to estimate mu sub x using the five stars, and as we have just described above, this estimate is called the sample mean, it's m sub x. Because m sub x star is itself generated from the five stars, it has a tendency, statistically speaking, to drift toward those stars, those quantities x sub i star. And this means that the square differences in the estimate equation at the bottom are biased. They tend to be a little too small. We make a compensatory boo-boo by not using lowercase n in the denominator, but instead using lowercase n minus 1. This deliberate error causes the denominator to be a little too small. With the denominator a little too small, and with the stuff inside the sum also a little too small, we magically get an estimate, s sub x star, that is an unbiased estimate of the standard deviation sigma x of the parent distribution. If we do not take the square root and instead write down just s sub x squared, that's called the sample variance. We can make sample means using the five circles, or using the five triangles, or using the five squares. Or using even other shapes I have not bothered to plot. And this procedure fills out a Gaussian distribution with its own mean, mu sub m sub x, and its own standard deviation, sigma sub m sub x. It should be intuitive that the mean, mu sub m sub x, of the distribution to the right is the same as the mean of the distribution to the left. It should also be clear that the width of the distribution to the right is narrower than the width of the distribution to the left. Sigma sub m sub x is smaller than sigma sub x. We write down a quantity called the standard error denoted s sub m sub x. It is formed by dividing s sub x upstairs by square root of n downstairs. 
We are dividing the sample estimate of the standard deviation of the parent distribution by the square root of the number of samples that are collected together to calculate any of the sample means. The standard error is an estimate of sigma sub m sub x, the width of the distribution of the sample means, as can be seen by the square root n factor, as well as by the illustration, the distribution to the right is narrower. Sample means tend to jiggle around less than the individual samples from which they were constructed. It's customary to draw error bars that look like I-beams. The half of the I-beam that extends above the sample mean is drawn equal in length to the standard error S sub M sub X. The half of the I-beam that extends below the sample mean must therefore also measure in length S sub M sub X. This means that the entire I-beam with portions extending above and below the sample mean is equal in height to twice the standard error. You can also generate standard errors, not using star but instead using circles, triangles, or squares. Notice that the error bars tend to thread the center of the distribution. This should happen about two-thirds of the time. If I draw a star sample mean and its error bars, I am betting that the actual center of the distribution which remains hidden from me, is somewhere inside the error bars, and I'm guessing that two-thirds of the time, my bet is right. The sample mean provides an estimate of where the parent distribution illustrated at the left is centered, and we can take the square root of the sample variance to obtain an estimate of that distribution's width. The standard error is an estimate of the width of the distribution to the right. Please report sample mean plus or minus standard error. That's sample mean plus or minus sample estimate of standard deviation of sample means. M sub x appears both to the left and to the right of the plus minus sign. Do not report M sub x plus or minus S sub x. This is not correct. The letter M in this incorrect example appears only to the left, not to the right of the plus minus sign. Do not report sample mean plus or minus sample estimate of the standard deviation of the individual samples. Instead, please report sample mean plus or minus sample estimate of the standard deviation of the sample means. This is what we graphically represent by plotting sample means with their associated error bars. In the previous slide, we introduced some equations for estimating where distributions are centered, what their widths are, and for relating the distribution to the left and the distribution to the right to each other. In this slide, we will derive some of these equations so we can understand the origins of the famous factor of the square root of n. The sample mean we defined was m sub x. What are the statistical properties of this quantity m sub x? We will calculate both mu sub m sub x and sigma sub m sub x, and let's start with mu sub m sub x. Every time we obtain a sample mean, we get a quantity indicated in the parentheses. This is what we obtained from the stars. But we could also perform the same calculation over and over again with circles, triangles, with squares, and so forth. Each of these shapes gives me a group of data points. Let's consider constructing sample means using capital G many groups of data points, meaning using capital G shapes. We are obtaining sample means from capital G different shapes, and then we are averaging over the results by adding up all of these sample means and dividing the sum by the number of shapes, capital G. We let capital G go to infinity, meaning that we consider arbitrarily large numbers of sample means. Stare at the sum for just a moment. It's a roundabout way of averaging lots of points from the original parent distribution so the mean mu sub m sub x of the distribution of sample means is itself equal to the mean of the distribution of samples mu sub x. The centers of the two distributions are in the same place. Now let's calculate the width sigma sub m sub x. It's convenient to begin with the variance sigma squared m sub x. Recognize that m sub x can be written out as x1 star over n plus x2 star over n plus a bunch of hoo-ha, and suppose that those data points x1, x2, x3, and so forth are independent measurements. This allows us to say that the variance of m sub x is just a sum over variances for those individual terms x1 over n, x2 over n, x3 over n, blah blah blah. 
if those x1, x2, x3, and so forth, if those xi's are drawn from the same distribution, then they have the same statistical properties. Those individual variances are the same, so we have n copies of the variance associated with measurement 1, which we will now calculate. Sigma squared of x1 over n is just shorthand for average of a square of a deviation of the quantity in parentheses. We are evaluating a particular value of the quantity x1 over n minus the average of that quantity and then squaring the difference and averaging that. We can pull out this constant factor of n from the denominator inside the inner brackets, and this in turn allows us to pull out a factor of n squared from this denominator. Recognize that the stuff remaining inside the averaging brackets is now the squared deviation of x sub 1. This is the square of the deviation of a particular measurement of x, the deviation from the average of many measurements of x. Hence, we have the average of the square of the deviation of x, which we call simply the variance sigma squared of x. Substitute this back over here, cancel one power of n above and below, and then taking the square root of both sides, we find that the standard deviation of the distribution of the sample means equals the standard deviation of the distribution of the samples divided by the square root of the number of samples that are put together to generate each sample mean. Sigma sub m sub x equals sigma sub x divided by square root of n. That's where the square root n comes from. Again, we don't actually have sigma sub x if we only have five stars, but we have the next best thing, which is s sub x, so we can make an estimate for sigma sub m sub x, call it s sub m sub x. It's generated not using sigma sub x, but instead using s sub x. In the previous section, we talked about the standard error. In the next section, we will provide visual intuition for a rule of thumb used commonly to compare error bars. Sometimes people classify pairs of error bars as non-overlapping, touching, or overlapping. They often regard the touching case as a special condition. The height of the flashing blue error bars provides an estimate of the width of the distribution of sample means from which the blue circle sample mean particularly illustrated was obtained. Because the blue and yellow error bars are similar in length, we can also regard the blue error bars as an estimate for the width of the distribution of the sample means from which we obtain the yellow star sample mean particularly illustrated. This distribution is sketched with the appropriate width. Is it plausible that the blue sample mean and the yellow star sample mean came from one same distribution with width as already indicated? Consider the possibility in which the distribution is centered between the two sample means. We are asking ourselves how likely it is that the star could have shown up somewhere on either side of this distribution displaced from the center as far as or even farther than it is illustrated. And assuming that the yellow star lands somewhere in the yellow wedge, we are further asking how likely it is that the blue circle lands on the other side of the distribution displaced from the center as far as or even farther than it is already illustrated. If you actually think that the illustrated Gaussian distribution is a reliable guess for the distribution from which the star and circle were plucked, then the chances of having one data point, say star, fall one standard deviation or more on either side, and then having the other data point also lie outside a standard deviation on the opposite side, if you trust all this, you say that the chances of obtaining such an outcome are 5%. When error bars do not overlap, it's hard to believe that data points came from the same distribution. When error bars overlap tightly, it's plausible that one same distribution is the source of both data points. Again, these error bars are merely estimates of the width of a standard deviation of a distribution of sample means, so they can fluctuate, and they might not always accurately represent the actual distribution of sample means. This is why we have placed scare quotes around the 5%, to give a feeling of uncertainty. In this most recent section, we've just reviewed a rule of thumb for comparing error bars and provided visual intuition. In the next video, we will discuss illusory sample size and illusory statistical significance.